Welcome to episode 37 of I Thought I Knew How, a podcast about knitting and life and all sorts. I'm your host, Anne Frost, and this episode was recorded on July 9th, 2020. Today, I am going to talk a little bit about wool because I'm going to talk a lot about possum. I will also tell you about someone I found who is making clever little gifts and helps for knitters. I have more about the knit along that is coming and some news and the countries for the next online international fiber festival and probably some more stuff. Always music because we do like to have a little break from time to time. Let's get started. A big, huge thank you to Candice and Annie for becoming patrons since the last episode over at patreon.com slash I thought I knew how. Patrons help with the running of the podcast and receive some benefits in return. If you would like to look into that more, you can hop over to patreon.com slash I thought I knew how and see if it makes sense for you. I love my patrons. And of course, patrons at the ribbing level and higher are invited to join us on the second and fourth Tuesdays from 4 to 7 p.m. Eastern time for some online knitting. And all of you are welcome to join in on the first Tuesday. Check out the I Thought I Knew How Facebook group for the first Tuesday link and patrons check the Patreon feed for the patron knit togethers. Our next patron knit together is July 14th and our next knit together for everyone is August 4th. And another thank you goes out to Candice, who took the time to leave a comment when she rated the podcast on iTunes. Rating and sharing episodes with friends is a great way to support the podcast by making it more visible to those who may enjoy it. So thank you for taking the time. I have a few little things I'd like to take care of first, and then we can have a music break and get into some learning. Yesterday, I sat down and visited with Karen Reel of Poppy's Pom Pom. Poppy's Pom Pom may sound familiar to some of you as they were a vendor in the Online International Fiber Festival back in May. I was able to speak to Karen about her pom poms made from upcycled fur coats and her exotic fiber yarns made from samoid and possum fiber. That interview is going to release next week and then there will be a bonus YouTube video that will release at the same time so that you can meet her samoids and actually see the pom poms and yarn. That will be episode 38 and then episode 39 will follow the next week. So you're going to get three new episodes of the podcast three weeks in a row. Second, I'm trying my darndest to cultivate an understanding of and appreciation for Pinterest. I know that there are people out there who love it to bits and I would like to make it be a positive resource for the show. So after really reading up on it and getting some advice last week, I think I'm starting to understand why people like it, and I'm trying to change the way I use it to be more helpful. So going forward, I'm going to aim to make a board for each episode that will basically be the show notes in Pinterest board form. My goal is to also go back in time and create the boards for previous episodes, and maybe by then some other ideas for boards will evolve. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is that if you are an avid Pinterest user, maybe follow me there. I'm also open to any tips that you might have. (laughs) It's I thought I knew how also on Pinterest. Finally, more has happened with the whole blueprint thing since the last show. I heard from the new owners that they are hoping to relaunch their version of the website on September 1st. They intend to keep the subscription model and plan to allow people to buy individual classes as well. Anyone who owns a class or who has a subscription will be able to finish out their subscription and will still own the classes that they bought. Then... A day or two later, they sent out an email to all their subscribers to let them know that when they relaunch, they will be going back to using the name Craftsy instead of Blueprint. I can't say I understand why they ever changed the name, and I think most people still call it Craftsy anyway. And some of the videos were shot in front of walls that have giant Craftsy logos on them, so that seems like a wise move. Anyway, what all this means is that now that I know all of this is settled and will be unfolding in the coming weeks, I am back to planning the next Online International Fiber Festival. The dates for the next festival will be November 9th through the 16th, 2020. I know many more people are back to work and others who are working from home are having to put in full days. So as with the previous festival, even though it's an eight-day event and each day will launch one right after another, you will be able to hop in and do what you like that day and then return to finish it up when you have a chance. Last time, it became clear that many of the areas we visited are big enough or populous enough to justify visiting them more than once, so some of the areas we visit this time will be looking at specific parts of larger countries. So we will start with the American Midwest. 
Then we will go to the Canadian Prairie, Peru, Japan, Estonia, Germany, the Hebrides, and Portugal. As I'm recording, five of the days are already planned out. (laughs) I'm contacting vendors now and getting the marketplace lined up. I would love it if you have a favorite food from one of those areas that is easily prepared at home with basic ingredients, if you could tip me off. That would be very helpful. More information about the festival will be forthcoming, but you can follow the Online International Fiber Festival on Facebook or at OI Fiber Festival on Instagram to get the news quicker. There's also an Online International Fiber Festival board on Ravelry. Speaking of Ravelry, I was just over there and saw that they have released a readability survey. Some of you probably know about the brouhaha over their new look. For some people, it's been triggering migraines, and I guess some people have even had seizures. I will say that I found it hard on the eyes and a little odd to look at before I heard that any of this was going on, so I tend to believe that it really is giving some people some actual problems. The survey that is up on their main page appears to be an attempt for them to find formatting that will affect the fewest number of people. It involves a lot of opening up files of different options and then checking the option that you prefer. I will say that there were some screens where I didn't prefer any of the choices, but that wasn't an option. The survey's only up until the 16th, so if you want to make your preferences heard, head over to Ravelry, and right on the main page there, you'll see the link to the survey. That was a lot of stuff. Let's have a song break and reset. You're going to hear this song and think it's May Klingler, but it is not. I certainly do have a type, though. This song goes out to anyone who is remembering someone today, especially if that someone is a lost love. This is Atusa Gray singing Radio. But I am on your mind And the way that you've been searching I'll be searching all my life And you remind me of an old, old song on the radio That I used to sing to myself Of an old, old friend that I used to know And when I think of him it always makes me smile
been burning, I'll be burning all my One of the vendors in the last online international fiber festival was NZGK Possum Fiber. That stands for New Zealand Gamekeepers Possum Fiber. They were selling possum fiber, (laughs) yarn, and educational kits. I picked up some of the yarn for myself and it arrived a few weeks ago. I've not had a chance to work with it yet with that specific possum yarn yet. And the website does not give the percentages of merino and possum fiber in the yarn, so I can't share that. But I will say that it's a very pale brown heathered shade. It's a Z-twist yarn and it has a slight halo to it that based on my experience knitting with other possum fiber yarns, I expect will become even more haloed with knitting. It's very soft to the touch and I'm thinking it will probably end up something cabled. After the yarn arrived, a few days later, I received another box and it ended up being one of the education kits. There's an option on their website to purchase one of these kits to have it sent to someone who will be able to use it to spread the word. So thank you to Maureen for sponsoring the kit, and thank you to Elizabeth for deciding to send it to me. It really is a handy little kit when learning about possum fiber. Inside, there are individually wrapped packets of A-grade and B-grade fiber. The A-grade fiber is a little longer and more uniform in length. The B-grade fiber is shorter and more variable. They recommend that if you plan to spin the fiber yourself, you stick with the A-grade fiber. Uh, There is also a smaller packet of the tail fiber, which is less soft, but is also hollow and more insulating. It used to be spun up with wool and used to make socks. They don't get into the detail as to why the tail fiber, whether it's because of the extra warmth or maybe it made the yarn more durable. I don't, I can't say. I tried looking online too and I couldn't find an answer. Also in the package, there's a felted ball, a strip of felted fiber, some roving, uh, a sample of the yarn, and a packet of machine plucked fiber that's a bit fluffier than the A-grade fiber. Also inside, there's an information packet with everything the NZGK group has been able to gather about possum fiber and its characteristics. So let's back up for a minute and talk about the history of possums in New Zealand and not all of this information is from the packet. I did. I went into a deep dive on the internet the other day to try and really understand this issue. First of all, those of you listening from North America, you need to keep in mind that we aren't talking about the possums we have here. Our possums are nocturnal, cat-sized creatures that look for easy ways to get food. They're basically hardwired to raid your garbage cans. They're good to have around because they eat a lot of ticks, but they are not what we're talking about. We're talking about the species native to Australia, the common brush-tail possum. It's also nocturnal, but it has a prehensile tail that helps it move among the trees, and it produces fiber that was highly desirable to trappers in the 1800s, so much so that in the early 1800s, some trappers decided to introduce the possum to New Zealand to extend its habitat and allow for additional hunting, and by 1857, they took. Now, we in the Northern Hemisphere tend to think of New Zealand and Australia as near neighbors. However, Sydney to Auckland is a nearly four-hour flight over 1,300 miles of ocean. The ecosystems of the two countries are very different, and New Zealand had no natural predators waiting for the possums. A cat may take one now and then, but not quickly enough to affect the population numbers. When the trappers stopped trapping them, the population exploded. The common brush-tailed possum will mostly live on the leaves of eucalyptus trees in Australia, but it will raid your garden if given the opportunity and has been seen eating smaller mammals. New Zealand does not have naturally occurring eucalyptus trees. The possums will still eat the leaves of some plants, but they have branched out. They are opportunistic omnivores, so they will eat things like flowers, nectar, berries, which means they're eating the foods that many of the native birds rely on. They also tend to eat all the parts of certain trees rather than just the leaves, which can stunt its growth severely and even prevent it from reproducing. They eat the eggs of native birds. 
There is a giant flightless cricket in New Zealand called a weta that are being eaten by the possum to the point that it's now got protected status. They take up the space that nesting birds need to build their nests in. They're even eating the native parrot. The Department of Conservation in New Zealand has set a goal to remove the predators that have been introduced to New Zealand, including the common brush-tailed possum, by 2050. As part of their efforts, they're using a poison called 1080. 1080 is sodium fluoroacetate and is toxic to all organisms that require oxygen to grow. It disrupts the Krebs cycle, which is how the organism gets the energy out of its food. Eventually, citrate builds up in the bloodstream of the organism and puts the possum into heart failure. The National Animal Welfare Advisory Committee rated 1080 a 6 on a scale of 1 to 8 for humane ways to kill an animal. 8 is the least humane way. 1080 scored a 6. The possums are doing massive damage. They need to be removed. The government of New Zealand has been dropping bait laced with 1080 over populations of possums who then eat it and die. They suffer an inhumane death and are left to rot or be eaten by one of the other creatures in the area who will then die an inhumane death and be left to rot. But also insects who feed on them will die. It can contaminate drinking water. It has killed the birds they are trying to protect. In some cases, it's a question of, well, do we leave the possums and know that they will kill a certain number of species, or do we kill the possums with 1080 and know that process will also kill a number of species and the possum? There is a more humane way to remove these animals that does not involve a cruel death or knock on environmental issues, and that is what the Department of Conservation in New Zealand euphemistically calls possum fur recovery. In the States, we would call it trapping. The current problem with using gamekeeping methods is that it is labor-intensive to go out and trap possums, and this is where the use of possum fur comes into play. Possum fur can be plucked from a possum fairly easily and bagged up for sale. The issue is that there's not enough demand for it to justify an increase in the number of trappers. It's a supply and demand issue. If I go out and trap 20 possums one day, I can sell the fiber for a certain amount. But if I go out the next day and trap 50 possums, unless there are more people who want to buy the possum fiber, I may not be able to sell more than 20 possums worth of fiber, or I may have to accept a lower price for it from the buyer because they don't really need 30 more possums worth of fur. This is one of the reasons why NZGK Possum Fiber exists. They're trying to educate the marketplace to help increase the demand for the fiber. They're also training gamekeepers on the quickest, most humane methods to administer the kill. It's not particularly pleasant to talk about, but the possum are causing extreme damage to the ecosystem in New Zealand. They have to go. A quick death is preferable to a lingering painful death that also has a knock-on effect to the environment. And the only way we can encourage the least cruel, least environmentally impactful method is to create a demand for the fiber. So there's the case for why these possum need to go and why it's the lesser cruelty in the long run for them to go through trapping. This is one of those rare instances where you hope an animal goes extinct, at least in New Zealand, where they clearly do not belong. The peak of the population was 60 million possum. They're now down to 30 million. Ideally, they will get it to zero in New Zealand, and at that point, we can all stop buying possum fiber. But for now, let's talk about why you might want to give this fiber a go other than for the reason of trying to encourage more gamekeepers to get out there and remove them from the ecosystem. So first of all, possum fiber is soft. It is soft, soft. We're talking 15 to 18 micron soft. That puts it in the range of cashmere, but the fur actually tapers to a point of one to two microns. The tips are the bits that poke you and create the prickle factor for people. A one to two micron tip means there's basically nothing there to poke you. I wish I could send you each a tuft of the possum fiber in this education kit. Angora fiber from rabbits comes in at 10 to 15 microns, but I cannot register a difference between angora and the possum. So many of us are familiar with angora. 
I cannot tell the difference between 10 microns and 15 microns. The possum fiber is hollow, which means that despite being super fine, it's very insulating. So adding it to wool will increase its warmth factor. It also draws moisture away from your body, just like wool. It's very lightweight. I believe we talked in the last episode about how wool is also a lightweight fiber, but adding possum to the blend can further lighten up the drape. Possum fiber does not have the crimp structure that many wools do. It's soft, fine, and smooth, which means that when it's blended with wool and knit up, it tends to develop a lovely halo. If you are a fan of the look of mohair, but find mohair to be itchy, this is a way that you can get that ethereal halo effect without the itchiness. It's also less likely to pill. Spinners, you can make a blend of up to 40% possum fiber by weight with another wool. Typically, because it's so soft, people tend to blend it with merino or with a close cousin like a polewarth. Dyers, I found several places online that mention that it will take and hold a dye well. And it's feltable. Okay, as you start to turn your attention to cold weather projects again, keep possum fiber and yarns in mind. There are mainstream yarn makers who are adding it to their wool blends, as well as smaller mills and organizations like the NZGK Possum Fiber Group who are making it themselves. I know I have several different types in my stash. I will provide a link to all the ones I have in the show notes, and maybe I'll make a board just for possum fiber yarns on Pinterest, as I thought I knew how. Because, you know... I'm becoming a Pinterest expert. <laughs> okay, I wasn't going to talk about all birds three episodes in a row, but several of you have bought them and have actually been in touch to say that you really love them. And that doesn't happen very often. I mean, I bring you products that I think are great, and lots of you have tried those products, and I assume you like them fine, but all birds is clearly something else because I've had several emails very quickly after I started telling you about them to let me know that they are as awesome as I said they were. If you are new to the show, All Birds uses sustainable and recycled materials to make shoes, socks, and undies. I am a big fan of their wool runners, which are machine washable merino wool shoes that feel like my feet are wrapped in a comforter sipping cocoa by the fire. That's probably not the best image because it's summer and you don't want to think about warm things, but I'm talking more about the soft, snuggly feeling of that scenario. They also have shoes made from eucalyptus fiber, and of course they have all sorts of different styles, especially for women, including everything from high tops to ballet flats. Check them out for yourself at tinyurl.com slash allbirdsshoes, and if you decide to buy, you'll be helping to support the show. That's tinyurl.com slash allbirdsshoes. I would like to tell you about a seller on Etsy named Kelly, who sells under the name Knit Swag. She is both a knitter and a graphic designer, and you know that a combination of talents like that is going to result in some pretty awesome merch for yourself or your knitting friends. She has phone cases with entrelock and lace printed on them, as well as ones with hanks of yarn and a really cute one that looks like yarn being held on a knitty knotty. There are a ton of mugs where the words are spelt out in knit stitches. I am a big fan of the one that says, Hello Sunshine, and it looks like the letters were knit with a gradient yarn. She has these hilarious t-shirts right now that are like quarantine hair inspired. So using knit stitches, she has created the shape of a shoulder length hairdo and rather thick eyebrows. (laughs) But the stitches at the very top where your roots would be where my roots currently are. The stitches are silver. I may need to get myself one of those. I have dyed my hair once this entire time. The roots are real, my friends. It's not just the fun stuff, though. She has created these notepads. She's called Knitter's Graph Paper. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that Knitter's Graph Paper already exists. But old knitter's graph paper is printed with rectangles instead of squares, and that's meant to help us plan out our fair aisle and stuff. But a knit stitch is very rarely a rectangle. It's a V. We all know it's a V. 
And the fact that it's a V matters in a lot of designs. So Kelly's knitter's graph paper in the Knit Swag store is printed in the actual shape of an actual knit stitch. You will get a much better sense of what the pattern will look like when it's been knit up because you'll be coloring knit stitches and not boxes. I don't know why I haven't seen this sort of thing before, but I think it is really clever. As if her graphic designs of cool knitted things aren't enough, she's also got several lovely knit shawl patterns up in her shop too. Some of her items can be personalized, so they'd be perfect for the knitter friend in your life or yourself. Let's be honest, we're going to shop for ourselves. Take a look at her shop on Etsy under the name Knit Swag. I'll put a link in the show notes, of course. Kelly sent me one of the Knitter's Graph paper pads and a set of her note cards. Yeah, I didn't even mention the note cards. They have knit motifs and designs on them, but now you know. And I have a set of them with a cheery knit sunflower on them and a pad of the Knitter's Graph paper to give away from Kelly, Ms. Knit Swag herself. You are going to love them. To let me know you're interested in winning the note cards and the Knitter's Graph paper, go look at the Knit Swag store on Etsy and pick which item from her store you think is the super coolest. And then look for the post in the Facebook group, I Thought I Knew How, with the picture of the note cards and the graph paper, and tell me in that thread what you think the super coolest thing in her store is. I will pick a winner through a random number draw on July 22nd, 2020, and I will announce the winner in episode 39, which should come out on July 27th. But really, I'll probably also say in the thread on Facebook who the winner is before then, but you'll hear it in that episode also. I bought myself some of her note cards a few months back, so some of you who are patrons have already gotten notes from me written in one of her alpaca note cards. I know how nice her stuff is already. Many thanks to Kelly for offering to spread the love among my listeners. This next song is another written by Louis Yolen. I've played his songs for you many times before, and I've never been able to find any information about him. I usually find artists who are putting out their songs hoping to be discovered. Lou, however, is a songwriter and music teacher who composes songs and has artists perform it for him and then puts the songs out there. So I have frequently brought you music by Lou from different genres and with different musicians involved. This is another such song called With the Breeze. Enjoy. Yeah. 
A few more things before I go. I was hoping to be done with the test knit for the knit along we are doing with Morehouse starting on July 31st. I simply am not. I will likely be done a day or two after this episode goes live, so look for the yarn information in the Facebook group, or I will be sure to share it in the next episode, which, remember, will come out next week not in two weeks. In the meantime, if you have not already laid your hands on a copy of the pattern book, what you are looking for is Shawls, Wraps, and Scarves by Louisa Harding. Check your library, check your local yarn store, and if they don't have it, use the link in the show notes to order it and you'll be helping to support the show with your purchase. It's about $13 as a Kindle book or $18 as a paperback, and Morehouse will be running three knit-alongs out of it and I'll be co-hosting two of them. Speaking of Morehouse Farm, they have a vendor slot for the upcoming session of Vogue Knitting Live on Thursday, July 16th at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. You will need a ticket to view the vendor session, so I'll put a link in the show notes for that. Erin has invited me to come help out with her vendor time, so if you'd like to, you can pop in there and watch us talk live about wool and Morehouse yarns and the upcoming knit along. I should have the Lark Salvina knit by then, so you will get to see it being worn. I sometimes wonder what you all must think about how much I bring up Morehouse Farm. First of all, Erin is a great advocate for wool and farmers and local businesses. But secondly, we found out about a year ago that we only live about 10 miles from each other, (laughs) which is very convenient when you're a knitting podcaster and a wool producer. And finally, Morehouse Farm yarn is incredibly soft and lovely yarn direct from the farmer who grew it with amazing pattern support and a fantastic team behind it. So it's only natural that I can't stop talking about it. When you find something fantastic sitting on your very doorstep, you spread that news around. I will talk to you all again in a week. In the meantime... Thank you for listening and knitting with me for a bit. If you'd like to support the show, please visit patreon.com slash I thought I knew how to make a monthly pledge or visit coffee.com that's ko-fi.com slash I thought I knew how to make a one-time donation to the podcast. You may also consider making a purchase from one of our sponsors by visiting the website I thought I knew how familypodcasts.com and clicking the link at the top that says be a booster. While you're on the site, you can also find show notes for each episode. Find me on my social media accounts as I thought I knew how, except on Twitter where it's just thought I knew how. The groups on Ravelry and Facebook are both called I Thought I Knew How Podcast. Until next time. May you be blessed with stitches that never drop, yarn without joins, and plenty of time to knit. <laughs>